coming to the stage first. Let's welcome to the stage our moderator, uh, our moderator of Essences, Shelby Stewart. And comedian, radio, TV personality, and author of the new book, Sideshow, Ricky Smiley. Good morning, good afternoon, how y'all doing? Thank y'all for coming, yes. Good morning, Ricky. How are you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? Am, I'm, am I ashy? I'm, okay, I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. I tried to, I tried to hit those cracks. You know, right out the shower. We. <laughs> I'm so happy to be talking yes. to you this morning about your new book. Yes. So can you tell me what made you want to pursue writing a book? Well, uh, this is actually my second book, but uh, people was like, uh, you should write about, you know, your tragedy because a lot of people go through this and uh, we're afraid to talk about grief and the grief process and you know how uh, you know everything that comes along with it so I decided to put it in a book because there's so many details that people don't get to see and people don't understand about it so I decided to to put it in a book. So we know that grief can be a very overwhelming journey and it's filled with twists, turns and all different types of challenges. What advice would you offer to anyone today who is trying to find their way through the complexities of grief? Therapy. Two things. Uh, uh, first, first, God. Uh, we have to lean on God, like, not just a little bit, not just a lot. I'm talking about to the point where your feet is in the air. Because when I found out my son uh, passed away, I was in, in my apartment. And I just needed God to get me to the elevator door because the entire hallway was spinning. And I had to make it from Dallas to Birmingham uh, and, and, and deal with that. Classmate! <laughs> and, and I had to, had to deal with all of that. And the hallway was spinning. I, and I, I told God at that point, if you could help me make it to the elevator, I can make it because I, I wanted to pass out. Uh, it, was, it, was a hard, it was a hard day. So in the book, you talk about your grandparents and how they played a pivotal role in shaping your life. Um, can you talk a, a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, I'm a product of grandparents, as y'all know. Seeing my comedy over the years, you could tell I was raised by, by wonderful, wonderful grandparents. Rest in peace, Ernest and Maddie Smiley, and my other grandmother, Ada Mae Armour. Uh, I watched my grandparents go through this. Uh, my dad died. Um, when he was 25 and I sat on the front row and watched my grandfather and uh, my grandparents, you know, go through the same thing. Uh, and that's probably more emotional for me than losing my son because I will never forget April the 11th, 1974, watching my grandparents cry like that and deal with that on that front row. And I became, and I'm the grandson of grandparents that suffered like that and end up going through the exact same thing. And I tried to model myself after my grandfather and how he handled that situation, how he led, uh, didn't even, didn't get the opportunity to grieve because he was busy leading and making sure everyone was okay. And I had to do the exact same thing. So uh, uh, I, don't, I can't remember what the question was. was did I answer your question? <laughs> yes, you did. I have ADD, so you know. You did, you did, you did. <laughs> So, in your book, you wrote, when you lose a child, you are not the same. Don't let anybody tell you different. Could you share, you kind of already did, but share more of your initial thoughts and feelings when you received that phone call. Oh, yeah, you're not the same. It's like you're, the world changed. The, the, um, the sun is not the same color. You don't feel the same way. The anxiety, the butterflies that sit deeply in the pit of your stomach, and you feel like you have leprosy, like you're walking around like something is wrong with you. And it's crazy because some of the only other people you recognize are other people that have lost children without them even telling you. you, you it's so weird. You can look in people's eyes and tell that they lost a child. And there's a, 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 a connect. I'm on stage performing, and I can look in the audience, and I can recognize the sadness uh, with the spirit of uh, discernment that God gave me. I can see it in people's eyes and know automatically off the top, in the middle of a joke, that that couple right there probably lost their kids. And most of the time, I've been right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, uh, what was the question? <laughs> 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 
too much coffee. No, you, uh, I was asking you, you had mentioned in the book that losing a child, um, it, you don't let anyone tell you different about how it feels to lose a child. Oh, yeah, it's yeah. difficult. And I wouldn't wish that on anyone. I hope and pray to God that no one has ever, uh, ever went through that. It's a lot. Mm -hmm. It's a lot. So, uh, but that's why you have to lean all the way on God because, uh, you know, it, it, definitely him. He will give you peace that surpasses all understanding. And I, and I tell you what, if you, don't, if you don't handle it a certain way, and if you don't handle it the right way, you could die yourself. You got other kids. You got to think about other parents that, whose situation is worse than yours and people that have lost more than one kid. Those are little, little tools that God gives you to help, help keep you going. You know, where you just won't just make it all about yourself or whatever. You know, I know it's a hard time and maybe the wrong time to be thinking that, but that's the kind of stuff that keep you going, though. Mm -hmm. So you also talked about in the book the importance of maintaining your composure in front of your family members and your other kids and things like that. Um, how have you managed to cope privately with those emotions of losing your son? Uh, go in a closet, close the door behind you, lay on the floor and cry and snot into the carpet and, until you just can't get it out of your system because uh, people always say be strong, uh, not crying. Uh, uh, raise your hand if you have a pressure cooker. Everybody have a pressure cooker? Yeah, y'all yeah, be that smoked turkey, y'all have to get their broth. <laughs> You have to get their breath right, that smoked turkey, because that smoked turkey boil all day, I know. Yeah. But not crying is building that pressure. Crying is, is, is popping that vent, releasing. Every time you cry, you release steam. You're releasing steam. So you have to get somewhere and cry it out. When it comes out, grief is greedy, as somebody told me. Grief is greedy, and it'll come at the strangest time. Uh, one time, I was getting ready to perform in Ohio, and uh, I left the hotel and I cried all the way until it was time to go on stage. I had a sold out show at the ha at Horrors Casino in, outside of Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, I blew my nose, wiped my tears, and went on stage and murdered the audience with jokes. And still tears, but they thinking that I'm crying, laughing at the jokes. I'm still crying about how I was feeling. But I've been performing so long, I know how to go through the motions of the jokes while crying. And that's one of the reasons why I named the book Sideshow. You remember that song, Sideshow? So you're going to see somebody perform to make you happy that's really sad on the inside. That's why in comedy you see the smiling face and the frowning face. Step right up. Hurry, hurry. Before the show begins, my friend, see the man who's been crying for a million years. So many tears. Let the side show begin. Hurry, hurry. Step right on in. Can't afford to what? Pass it by, but guarantee to make you cry. So I named it after that song. That song came out around the time my dad died, and I would hear it, so it just like, it feels like everything came around a uh, full circle. I'm sorry. I'm just... No, no, you're doing fine. You're doing fine. <laughs> I think that's a great segue into my next question. I think that I'd like to think that your ministry is known for bringing laughter and joy to those in need. And so how are you replenishing your own emotional and spiritual reserves when you start to feel depleted? Well, I started what last one? Feel depleted. Um, I just do stuff that I like to do. You have to find things and do things to make you happy. You have to serve. You have to go to the Salvation Army. Uh, I, talk, I have a segment in my book where that Wednesday uh, before uh, I had my son clothes in the car to take to the funeral home. I got off the air. They, tell you, they say, take as much time as you need. I said, no, I'm going to stay on the air. Because people in Chicago, their kids got killed too. Well, they depend on the Ricky Smile and Morning Show to get them through their day. Too much is given, much is required. Who are you to take off work, to lay in the bed, to only think about everything you went through when you can sit on the radio and just do your job and make somebody else happy and let the audience go through the grief with you because they worried about you, want to know that, that, you know, know that you're okay. 
And uh, I just felt like it was, respons it was responsible to go to the Salvation Army, which I do anyway, that Wednesday with my son clothes in the car. It was dark. It was cloudy. It was windy. It was raining. And all the homeless people coming through the line just to get a hot dog with some sauerkraut, a handful of chips, and a slice of cake for lunch. With your clothes, son's clothes in the car, all the homeless people, hey, Rick, man, sorry about your son. Hey, Rick, man, we praying about you. Hey, Rick, man, I lost my son also. And I said, God, you really owe me because much is given, much is required. I said, but I, was, I did that to show God that despite of what I was going through, I was going to still serve. Even in the, the darkest, that was the darkest day of that week that I still wanted to just serve. And I left and went to the funeral home with my son closed, and it felt like every truck that went past me was blowing mist on the window. I felt like I was going to have a car accident. I didn't feel like I was going to even make it. And uh, that was one of the darkest days. Uh, that was February the 1st, 2023, three days before the funeral. And um, I had to think about others. Yeah. Serving at the Salvation Army like I've been doing every year is my outlet. When I, when I feel bad about something, kind of reminds me that someone else is going through something mm -hmm. uh, much worse. So I wanted to serve, and I just wanted to show, you know, that helped me. So you talked about the Salvation Army, but I also know you have a boat, right? Yeah. yeah. Going fishing, getting out there on the water, listening to the Eagles and, and Fleetwood and Mac and Frankie and Beverly and Mays. And it's crazy because my son, uh, he, he was into boating as well. I would always take him with me. They grew up on the water. We, we from Alabama. We river rats. We go bass fishing and all that stuff, and we play that music. And it seemed like every song that come on, it was songs that he liked, so you can't escape it. So that was a good outlet. But then you got to think about a lot of people that don't have the resources. My son was 32, who lost a 15, 16, 17-year-old. They can't just get on a plane and, and go somewhere and get on the boat and relax and go fishing. They got to sit in a small room and watch the walls close in. They can't, don't even have the resources to even get therapy. So that's why I continue to get on the radio every morning and continue to spew out uh, positivity and just trying to uh, make sure that people at least get their day started because you don't know what somebody else is going through. So that, that, that was the purpose of that. So good book, y'all. You got to read it. It's, <laughs> it got a lot of stuff like that in it. So in the black community, it's common for us to use work or other distractions excuse me, to cope with grief. Based on your experiences, what do you believe is the most effective way to confront and process grief head on? Let it out. Feel it. Man, my therapist is so awesome, Miss Tandy. Feel what you feel. And whenever you feel it, men, it's okay to cry. I'm talking about break down on your knees, man, and just, just cry. If anybody got a mama or an auntie that'll hold your head between their chest and rock you, it's okay. Let it out, man, and, and, and cry. You'll feel better. Don't hold it in because it's going to come out one way or the other, if not today, tomorrow, or, or at, at, the, at, at a, a time you don't expect it. You know, feel what you feel. Express your emotions and let it out and get help. Go to grief counseling. You know, I do, I do work with the circle of mothers for years. Before this happened to me, such a coincidence, with uh, Sabrina Fulton down in Miami, she does the circle of mothers where she get all these mothers that have lost kids. And I, I used to go to that stuff. And I just couldn't imagine how they went through that. And then I went through it, you know. Um, so it's, it's so important to feel what you feel and don't, you know, uh, don't block it out. Don't act like it don't exist. Absolutely. So generational trauma can manifest in various ways, including genetic predispositions to certain addictions and things like that. In your book, you mentioned the agony of balancing hope and fear for your child's recovery. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, uh, we've been dealing with this since he was about in the 11th grade. 
you know, once they uh, once they leave, uh, once they once they leave your house, once they leave your house, you don't have no control over anything. You know, um, I, I think the thing that I regret, I didn't, I did not understand the behavior. You know, I didn't under tissue. I didn't understand the behavior of my son, so there was a disconnect. So I had to set some boundaries with him because I could not allow him to have an effect on the rest of the kids that was buying into what I was teaching. He just, my son wanted to do his own thing. And it was just real, um, it was just real, real, real tough for me and stuff. So, um, I, what's the, did I answer it? Yes. Perfect. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Make sure. Thank you. Okay. So, life has often throws unexpected challenges our way, and it requires us to juggle multiple responsibilities at once. How did you manage the balance of supporting your other children through their grief while also grieving yourself? Well, the bills don't stop coming. You can sit up there, you done buried Big Mama, and Monday come around, you better, you better go, you better, you better go somewhere and lay down that Sunday because you got to go back to work. And then the, the other thing is, we got to figure out what, what, what would our loved one want us to do. Everybody that lost a mother or your favorite aunt, what do they want us to do? Do they want us to sit at home and be sad, or do they want us to continue to move on and continue to do uh, do what you're doing? They want us to be happy because they are they are not suffering anymore. They are in a better place, and we have to we really have to understand that and process that. Yes, we miss them. Or whatever, you know, my son was going through what he was going through. He was going through a lot. And uh, everybody know who Miss Janie is, right? Everybody follow me on Facebook, know Miss Janie. Miss Janie called me. Um, she called me over to her house one day because Miss Janie lost two sons. I had to walk her down the aisle at both of those funerals. And she sat me down and closed the door, and she took the phone off the hook. And she got in my face, and she said, listen. She said, God came and took that boy. She said, you're going to have to let him go. She said, do you understand me? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, you're going to have to let him go. It's, you got to let him go. He's in a better place. He's not suffering anymore. And that was probably one of the first stages of me processing that that's what it was, you know, and uh, I received that and tried to un understand that he was in a better place and um, try to move on and try to think about others that's suffering. Sometimes God allow us to go through something, especially if you have a platform, to use your platform to bless someone else who's, get, who's going through, been through the same thing or getting ready to go through the same thing because everybody going to deal with grief. This book is going to help you, whether you have grief or not, but it's coming. Even if it's you, it's coming because we're not meant to stay here on this earth. So it's a good tool with some good scriptures in there that's going to help a lot of people. So we know that grief is not a linear process. Where would you say you're at with your grief today? Uh, I think this, I was talking to my therapist yesterday. We were texting. I think I'm at a space where I just kind of blocked it out. You know, just kind of like I put it in a box and put it right there because I got to go on because I got, I got a son and a daughter that's in grad school. I have grandkids. Um fighting to see my only uh, biological granddaughter. I got nieces and nephews, and I have a mother. I have step-grandparents. I just buried my step-grandmother two weeks ago, who was there for me the whole time. She was 95, God bless her. But you got other stuff that you got to do, so sometimes you have to take that and put it right here. And when time permits, you could get back to it and deal with it later. And uh, sometimes the feelings come up, maybe at church, 
pastor singing something, maybe in the car, you know, or maybe just anywhere, but, you know, but I'm doing good. I'm doing good. So I, I thank God for that, because without him, I wouldn't be where I am. Absolutely. So you brought up therapy as well, and we know therapy can be a valuable yet sometimes daunting process. So what are some of the insights from your therapy experiences um, and some of the lessons that you've learned? The main, th the main thing is, is, is not to feel guilty for setting boundaries. Uh, we had a distance. He died in the process of the distance, but I was still behind the scenes helping him out on other stuff, still being a dad still being the best dad that I could possibly be. And uh, I didn't know he was going to die. Had I, if I did, I would have jumped in my car. I would have put, put a stash or something in an ashtray where he could get locked up and go to jail just to save his life. You know, I didn't know. I was just going on about my morning, getting ready to, to go to church. I had just uh, called my mom, asked her, had she talked to him because we were, we were supposed to be talking before his birthday, which was like three days later. And my mom said she talked to him and she's about to go pick him up, take him to church. He was going to go to church with her. He was dead 45 minutes later. I had to get on a plane and fly to Birmingham and, you know, and deal, and deal with that. The question was, I'm sorry. Insights from your therapy sessions. Oh, but my therapist just taught me just to cry when I need to cry. Um, take it one day at a time and just continue to, uh, you know, continue to, to live and enjoy myself, do things that I like to do, do things, you know, that, that are, bring happiness to me because happiness and laughter is everything. So I go to, now I end up going to a lot of comedy shows. Instead of performing, I go to comedy club and sit in the audience and laugh and have a good time. So uh, stuff like that, being around other kids, being around the rest of the family, uh, that, that helps out a lot. Cooking, uh, fishing, all that stuff, so yeah. So you mentioned before that grief is greedy. So in those unexpected moments where grief can kind of come in a wave, what are you doing um, when you know grief kind of threatens to overwhelm you in those moments? Uh, <laughs> for me? I got, I got some steps in the kitchen that I sit on, and I just sat in my house for months. When, I, when those funeral directors say when the flowers have withered and the calls stop coming and the text messages stop coming, you left there to feel everything that you felt. And it's just you in the house, and you sit there, and uh, you, just, you just go through it. I'm talking about sat on the steps and cried uh, many tears. My closet, getting dressed, sometimes doing the morning show. So think about this. We're doing a morning show every morning. The number one, it all, it's always the number one song on the Billboard charts that take you back to that moment when you found out that your loved one died. So for me, it was Tim's. So I'm sitting here doing the Ricky Smiley morning show. Whenever Tim's come on, I get these butterflies and this anxiety that sits in the bottom of my stomach. But we got to play the song because it's, on the, it's in the computer for us to play for the morning show. And sometimes you take your headphones off. Sometimes you just sit there through it. Sometimes you come out of the song early if you feel like you can't take it. Hey, let's go to commercial. Just doing whatever you have, you have to do. But um, it's, it's, all, it's all part of it. And so now we're, you're over a year later. Um, so what are some, what's your routine now? What are the self-care practices? What are you doing to take care of your mental health? Uh, just remaining in therapy and just having a good time. Mm -hmm. Enjoying people, enjoying uh, surrounding yourself with love. Uh, I had 30 nieces and nephews and kids. They all came over the day before Father's Day with bags and they all came in, surprised me, and spent the night, all 30. They, they was everywhere. <laughs> they all came and spent the night. Uh, a lot of kids that I raised over the years, I, I raised a lot of kids that not biologically mine. A lot of kids didn't have nowhere to go, didn't have mothers, didn't have fathers. So for years and years, I 
poured resources into other children, making sure they had what they needed. And they all came and spent the night. That was a lot of fun. That brought a lot of joy. Uh, I did a photo shoot. And uh, so just being around the kids make me happy. Absolutely. So in chapter 13 of your book, you discuss the transformative power of changing your heart posture and embracing gratitude. Can you describe the moment or realization that made you understand the necessity of keeping your heart open and being gracious? Yeah. Uh, you know, sometimes you kind of closed off. All of the condolences helped me out, even just walking through the airport, especially Atlanta. I just remember Atlanta airport. TSA agents coming around from their post to come and give me a hug. And some, a lot of women would just hug you. They would not say a word. Like, I just remember women with silver and black hair, them aunties, and they come and they wrap their arms around you and give you a hug and don't say a word. And I'm talking about, it would, it would literally make me cry because you felt all of it. You knew what that hug said. You knew what that hug meant. And it was just, just, just everything. That gave me a lot of thankfulness and a lot of gratitude. I had a lady uh, step outside the line. She said, I know what you're feeling. She said, my daughter was 13. My daughter died. I stepped out of line, and me and that lady hugged. We was at Atlanta Airport. We just hugged for about 10 minutes. And everybody in that line, it seemed like they knew what was going on? And, and I could just look around. I could see it in everybody's face. Because, you know, one thing about black folks, we wear it on our face. Mm -hmm. And they just had this. And I'm talking about people had their hand over their heart. They knew that that lady had been through something and that that lady was trying to comfort me while I was trying to comfort her as well because she lost her daughter a year prior to. So I found myself uh, comforting other people that have went through the same thing. You know, uh, so that brings me a lot of gratitude. So grateful for all the prayers, thousands and thousands of messages on social media. Um, just it's a lot of love out here, and, and I am grateful. Everybody that ever prayed for my family, I'm really grateful. And so time for one last question. So what is the most paramount thing that you want people to be able to take away from Sideshow? Uh, that you can get through it. Hey, if I never knew God a day in my life, if I never, ever, ever knew God or felt God a day in my life, January the 29th, I did. Because when people start talking about those footprints in the sand, when you only saw one set, it was only one set. Because ain't no way I did, I was able to do that. God, like, really, really, really carried me through that. And then he gave me the wisdom and the knowledge to lead. He gave me the wisdom and the knowledge to make it not about me and to think about my son's mother and my, and my son's stepfather. I had to comfort them, having sensitivity from down to the obituary, to the, the, the video, to everything, just making sure that everybody was comfortable, everybody had what they needed, and just put me in a position to just lead. Even though I was going through it myself, he said, you're going to get your day to cry, but right now, I need for you to stand up and, and lead because your family needs you. And took me all the way back to 1974, watching, seeing what my granddaddy did when my dad died. And uh, so it was, it, was, it was something. It was something, but if nothing else, Lean on God because God is real. God will get you through it. He is awesome. His grace, his mercy is sufficient. And I'm talking about he's an awesome God. Because I should be dead. I wanted to die. I, uh, there was moments where I wish I was dead than to feel those anxiety. I never felt butterflies like that, not even on a roller coaster. Deep down, I still get them deep down in the pits of your stomach. Those butterflies where you can't eat, you can't sleep, you can't think. He didn't take my appetite away. He didn't take my sleep away. Kept me enclosed in my right mind. And then he helped me through because through death, there's the insult to injury. 
See, y'all, that's something we don't talk about, the insult to the injury. It's like you already got a gun wound, a gunshot wound, and somebody come with a knife and stab you in that open hole, whether it be coworkers, whether it be family members, somebody going to come that's going to be out of order, out of place, and for you to maintain your integrity but God. That's it. Everybody give Ricky Smiley a round of applause.